Hey everybody! Welcome to the Captain Quail Vlogcast. Wait, are we recording? I don't remember you. We've been recording before. for like five minutes. I was just sneaking it in on you guys. Uh, okay. Hello, is this on? Uh, <laughs> now you, 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 Mark is going to get to this ah, point. Ears, <laughs> ah! <laughs> I know, that's exactly why I went, oh, you're okay. In my defense, I didn't know I was doing that to you until I'd just done it. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I know. If I if I like leave the room while we're still recording, you guys are just gonna like sabotage it. <laughs> get the drumsticks out. <laughs> guys, how can we get drumsticks right now? <laughs> okay, now that we're done messing with Mark as he's editing, hey everybody, welcome to the Cat and Quail vlogcast. Today we are looking at Cat and Quail sixty five. I am Philip. I am your host. I'm joined by Allison. Hello, Mark. Hey, what's up, guys? And You're Chris. Good tonight. Hi. Stay classy. Stay classy, vlogcast viewers. It's been a while since we've actually talked about the comic, and normally we're trying to just kind of talk about whatever comes into our heads, but I want to spend a moment and have Allison talk a little bit about what's going on with this particular strip. So, this one I actually had a... I, I struggled with it a lot, um, composing the shots. I had a good idea in my head for the first two panels, but the third one, like you can see in the video, I was just really struggling with the initial layout. It hasn't been apparent in these last videos, but it is something that I do struggle with from time to time. It's just like trying to figure out what does that panel, what, what is it going to look like, you know? So I thought it was important to leave in uh, the stuff that gets deleted and ripped out when I'm going through this process to just like give you guys an idea of hey like it's not always super smooth and it doesn't always flow for me. And from my point of view it's always interesting to see how like our comic creation process is a bit like a game of telephone. I have a picture in my head that I try to express in words. Allison then reads those words, forms a picture in her head and tries to put it down onto digital paper. And most of the time the meaning is conveyed, but it's never exactly how I picture it in my head. I'm immensely pleased with how the comics are coming out, but it, it's always an interesting exercise in like trying to translate and communicate between two people. Um, but yeah, we are rapidly approaching the close of this uh, storyline, which internally we've been calling Quail Effect, for what I hope are obvious reasons. <laughs> If they're not obvious, that's fine. Maybe we'll do a write-up to explain it. Um, but this series has been heavily based off of Mass Effect. Uh, we'll talk about that more because we still have at least five more vlogcasts that are going to be dealing with strips from this series. But we're going to change topics right at the moment and ask Mark, how you doing, man? I'm doing fine. I'm just staring at the comic on the screen and like making sense of it. Well, I mean, I'm just reading it. Oh. I'm just... As you were talking about, you know, trying to convey uh, the idea and the, it being translated, I was just taking it in and kind of wondering, like, oh, how might have Phil's vision been? And, like, you know, and then seeing how it's been realized by Allison, and it's just, it's cool to see that. Oh, yeah, actually, that's, uh, that's an interesting point, now that I think about it, is I really did drastically change what the third panel was. I At least I think you had a much different vision for it, and I could see that your vision was different, but I was like, that's going to be really hard to draw. No. <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, I've got a professional life to balance here. <laughs> I've often noticed that where my different, where the vision changes often directly corresponds with how difficult or complicated I have made the panel sound. <laughs> yeah. Well, it's also like, it is a fixed size, um, so right. a lot of the times... I could not balance, like, in that particular case, I could not balance that much detail and keep it that size. I would have had to, like, you know, draw it much bigger, and that doesn't really work in that space. So, so I was trying to get the meaning across, like, what was, um, but without the specifics that you had uh, scripted in. Sure. Chris, how are you doing? Good, good. I, I always get a kick looking at the, uh, the comics, because, uh, the space stuff really appeals to me, so I, mean, I don't know why. It's just stupid stuff like Star Wars. You You're know, just it's... a fan of space, yeah. Neil deGrasse Tyson well, style. No, 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 it's more Star Wars than, Degr yeah, than Cosmo. But, um, <laughs> just like the, the blue-white stuff, I don't know, for some reason that just that just gets me. It's like, Star Wars. 
Did oh, you just so, like, you know, oh, I'm, the, I've oh. got the music in my head like, I don't know, just simple stuff like that. Yeah. I know you spend ages on it because I, I watch, I watch your, your, your fast forward drawing stuff and uh, I just, yes, you know, that stuff appeals to me and I know it takes a lot of effort. So Yeah, I definitely see some um, uh, Ship Bay inspiration from the, or the Ship Bay from the Death Star the, yeah. when they pull in the exactly. Millennium Falcon in the yeah. last panel. Yeah, so that, for me that just, that hits me. I know. Clearly it just you hits, you, hits, hits you right in the nostalgia videos. feels. <laughs> I, I was gonna say, we think you're both great guys, obviously, but I'm I'm tickled by the fact that you got that you're bringing this up. By the way, if you've watched all our videos and you're listening to this one, we didn't set this up, but in our second video, we talked about the fact that I deliberately put in references into the script that the ship bay on the Enterprise should look like the ship bay in on the Death Star where the Millennium Falcon is being pulled so in. I was, oh, I was that, that audio. comes full circle <laughs> I, was, I was zooming through. <laughs> in fact, you, were, even, you were skimming the video. Yeah. I even put links to a Google image search of the shot that I was looking for to Alice and like, hey, here's some inspiration. <laughs> I th nice. Glad it came right. across well. accomplished. Yeah. Absolutely. So s going along with that theme... And given that we've been talking a lot about Star Trek and J.J. Abrams recently, does anybody have any clear opinions, and we'll, we'll start with Chris, any clear opinions on the kind of continuation slash reboot of the Star Wars series with J.J. Abrams at the helm? I only saw an interview with him, and it was like six months or a year ago or something, so I, I just don't know what's going on with that right now. I mean, he said all the right things I wanted to hear, which was... Wait, well, what are the things that, if it, what are the things you want to hear out of a Star Wars director? Um, I don't want to hear Jar Jar Binks, <laughs> unless it's followed by the words, no, no, <laughs> no, nope. or Chuck Testo, or, nope. or death. <laughs> no, that, that might be okay, but then I'd want to, I'd want to hear the word torture scene as well, but then that's, Ooh. that's not really going to work for Disney, so. <laughs> not so much. <laughs> Shot out of the trash hatch. <laughs> well, that could work. Lost to the trash compactor monster. <laughs> I'm sure there's some Star Wars fan out there who knows. It's actually called a blank, but I don't know what it's called. I apologize. My Star Wars geekdom is not as good as it should be. Uh, Minus nerd cred points. Minus nerd cred points. We need a little yeah. scorecard for that, and every time someone you know forgets a bit of nerd trivia, just hand them a you know minus one. Man, wouldn't it be great to get to the like to have such an advanced production setup that we could have like little counters in the corners of the video of like who's got the most nerd points for an episode? Just like assign them randomly, so as you're watching the video, they go up and down. I think about crazy things. Yeah, you, you think about crazy things, and then you subtly hint at them. <laughs> hey, Mark, what are you doing? <laughs> hey there, video editor. Yeah, that's that's totally fine. But uh, to trump your nerd cred point, did you ever run uh, your own series of Star Wars D and D games? I was a GM for a, a series of uh, oh. adventures in that universe. Oh man, that sounds awesome. Tell me a little bit more about that. Um, one of my friends actually made a documentary for, for their, uh, well, for their documentary class at UC Santa Cruz about the game that we were playing. Um, I was, so I had got my hands on some of the books and I really wanted to play it. I didn't really have a good group to play with that were like experienced players or someone that wanted to DM because I had only played D&D a handful of times, so I didn't really feel like I would be able to GM a game. And then, uh, it just ended up, uh, getting getting known by some of my friends that I had those books and so it fell on me to be the GM and I was over preparing and trying really hard to make like a nice adventure for them to go along it was really kind of like just a straightforward path that I found off like someone's adventure tips on online and then immediately they messed it all up they as soon as they had somewhat of a break in the adventure that I set up, they stole a ship uh, <laughs> from from the like wealthy benefactor that I had set them up with to like help fund and like establish the Rebel Alliance. And they're just like, yeah, we're gonna take one of his transports. <laughs> then one of then like one of the guys rolled a stealth roll, <laughs> um, got a natural twenty before I could say you can't do that, <laughs> uh, and then. And then, um, so he, like, just, like, snuck onto the ship, apparently, and started the engine, and then the pilot just sprinted into the ship, 
and he had like a plus 17 to pilot or something so it's just whatever he rolled it was awesome <laughs> and then just everyone sprinted onto the ship before i could like s come up with anything reasonable that like and then a meteoroid uh, comes down and destroys your ship and you guys can't do that <laughs> That sounds like exactly how it, I would expect a game of Star Wars role-playing to go, which is everyone thinks they're Han Solo and acts accordingly. Yes, uh, and then so I got so fed up with trying to have a plan for games that I just started <laughs> improv it the entire time, and my friends actually really started to enjoy it because I just developed characters that were just really loud, brassy, and sassy. And I would just, like, insult them the whole time. <laughs> I would criticize their characters and just make fun of them. <laughs> and they loved it so much that my friend made a documentary about it. <laughs> wow. Allison, what do you think about the fact that J.J. Abrams is now at the head of at least two franchises? <clears throat> you seem uncertain. I'm very uncertain. Did his Star Wars movies not... Or Star, well, Star Wars, wow, I'm getting ahead of myself. Did his Star Trek movies not impress you too much? So, I liked the first one, but... Gosh, the second one was just like, oh man. I mean, so something that I really enjoy and look for in media franchises is female characters that are actually multi-dimensional characters. And, I mean, you know, the original Star Trek was, like, pretty great in terms of, you know, having a diverse cast and, like, women in engineering and, like, well... Like, all sorts of awesome roles. And then, like, in the second movie, Uhura barely has any speaking lines. And it was just, like, <sighs> so disappoint. So... Yeah. It was more about, like, the bromance between Kirk and Spock. And which, then kind you know, of inviting the third party con into it. <laughs> no, it was mostly, like, you know, the un the gratuitous underwear scenes. Yeah. just like It just mm -hmm. pissed me off. Uh, you know, because I love Star Trek, and I really wanted to love the movie, but I had to hate it instead. I, at the time, when I saw it, my critique of it, and look at us, pretending like we can critique things. My critique of it was that it's a great mo It was a good movie, but it was not a good Star Trek movie. That was how I came out of the th theater thinking. Like, because I, you know, similar to Alice and I, semi-grown up watching the other Star Trek movies where action definitely happened, but they weren't action-packed explosion fests. They were a little more cerebral, and they were always, like, more thought-based solutions to problems and more diverse casts. Um, while I enjoyed Into Darkness, dun, 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 it, it didn't feel like a Star Trek movie to me. So I'm curious to see what he's going to do with the wars. Um, but I have to admit... Happy that Lucas isn't directing them. Yeah, but J.J. Um, uh, Abrams is a professed Star Wars fan, and he's he's gone on record saying, I'm a Star Wars fan over a Star Trek fan. I just happened to get my hands on the Star Trek franchise. So he's coming like out of fanboy to, to do these. Uh, and to Star do Wars Star is Wars about movies. action. So yeah, that's true. So, so, you know, his lens flares and glitz and glam will fit appropriately. <laughs> just prepare for so many lens flares on lightsabers. You guys, but, uh, did, did you guys see, I know I posted this to a place where theoretically you all could have seen it, but the very, like, in-depth physics technical breakdown of how a lightsaber oh, yeah, can work. Yeah, that was great. And, like, the way that they claimed that it worked, if I remember the gist of it, is that there's actually a coil of super fine, like, fiber optic cable coiled inside the lightsaber handle, and light pressure from the energy source pushes it, to, extends it to the length that it should be, and when you turn off that energy source, it collapses back into the coil. So that's why it's only a fixed length, is because there's actually, like, a filament on the inside, and you're just pushing so much power through it that that's why it can cut things. Wow. Yeah. He said that, like, it, basically making the argument that these things are totally buildable if we could find a power source that would power them. And he, cl like, the claim is, the only reason the Jedi can use them, and that only the Jedi can use them, is because the Force is equivalent to, like, having a nuke in your hand. Yeah, but dude, it's not only the Jedi, there's the Sith, too. Sith are just emo Jedi. Dark Jedi. I think they're the cool <laughs> Jedi. What are you talking yeah, about? Yeah, I know. Mm, I don't know, man. That last movie where, like, I killed them. 
I killed them all. You killed where where, young where Luke Skywalker tries to be Batman and fails miserably. Yeah, I, I don't know what movie you're talking about. <laughs> the third movie with Jar Jar Binks. There's no Star Wars movies with Jar Jar Binks. It's just episode four. Still and that's waiting. it? It just ends at episode four? Still waiting on those one, two, that's threes. Like, that's like the first one. I mean, he had some ideas he might do a prequel or something, but if he'd done that, he'd have done an awesome job, and I would have seen those movies. <laughs> <laughs> that's, I mean, and also, isn't it a shame that they only ever made one Matrix movie? That's that's right. One moment, just ends on a high note. Crying shame. I hear that they're actually thinking about extending that series again as well. Really? Like, Warner Brothers has been talking with the Wachowski family to, I don't know if it's going to be prequels or if it's going to be continuations, but they're they're digging back into the Matrix. Like that well didn't run dry. <laughs> I mean, so just today I was talking with somebody about the Animatrix, which has everybody seen? That? Yes! That awesome. It's so good. So if we got more stuff that was in the vein of the Animatrix, that would be awesome. If we got more stuff in the vein of Matrix Revolutions... Well, I think the thing about the Animatrix is like it was tackled by a bunch of like independent studios that had like nothing to do with like really big Hollywood. Right. So I mean, hmm, coincidence? I think not. Well, also this is relevant to Mark since we went to the same high school. Yeah. You should watch the Animatrix for many reasons. One of them is there is yeah. you've heard this right. Yeah. One of the vignettes in the Animatrix. All of the scenes at the school are shots of the high school that Mark and I went to. Wow. Yeah, so, like, we can watch this and see uh, our high school. The outside is based on the outside of our high school. The inside of the high school in that in that short is actually based on Berkeley High, is what I heard. Well, no, there's definitely one shot from the inside of the school. Maybe the hallways are based on Berkeley High, but there's one internal classroom shot that's based... It, on the classrooms that were in the old library building next to Kaufman. Oh, wow. Because I was in one of those classrooms like, man, this looks familiar. It's definitely <laughs> one of those. Okay. Yeah. But uh, the, the story goes that that production company, which was from, like, Japan or something, um, knew the principal of the high school at the time. Like, there was some connection there, and so they asked him if he... It was a Japanese animation company that this, based off of an American dude, high school? this is what I hear anecdotal evidence. Okay. And today I found out, again, this is like... Urban legends about a spin-off from a major movie franchise. The kid from that particular scene, so it's the one with the school, right? Where the kid basically like um, think he dreams he can fly, like the jump. I can't remember the guy's name. It's not Neo, but you know which one I'm talking about, right? Yeah. Um, he is supposedly the annoying kid that follows Neo around in the second and third movies. That there's supposed to be a connection there. And apparently he's also the only person to have ever self-manifested. Like, he popped himself out of the machine without any... Okay. Oh, any external of, like, the, the blue pill or red no pill? Blue, no blue pill or red pill. He just, like, popped himself out externally. Again, this is anecdotes of rumors of urban legends about a spin-off to a movie franchise. So we are way deep into fandom at this point, but... If you have any fan theories about Captain Quail, we would love to hear them. You should let us know on our Twitter page, at Quail Comics, on our Facebook page, facebook.com slash Quail Comics, or send us an email at captainquail at inkpebble.com. Also feel free to send us questions. We'll happily answer them on the show here, or at least heckle the questions that you've submitted. We don't do that much. Uh, but I think we're getting close to a wrap-up. I actually do have a question for you. Oh, man, a question for yes, me. I want for it. you. So, so it was proposed at the start of this uh, particular vlogcast. They're like, oh, yeah, well, Allison, you might want to try doing the intro. And I was like, no. And so, like, these are not scripted intros. Phil says the things he says, and they come out, like, perfect. I'm like, how do you do that? So this is what I want to know. Is, this, like, you want to know how I do the, that? The intros and the extras. Um... I, so... He's just that damn good. Thank you, thank you, Chris. Uh, part of <laughs> it is... theater, folks. <laughs> yeah, so most... Uh, a fair number of the people in this room know that throughout high school, I was heavily involved in theater. Before high school, He's I was... being modest. I was, was gassed on. Hold on, hold on, hold on. <laughs> what? Lightly involved in theater, but I also did kids' birthday parties and, like, magic shows. And you don't really script those. You just kind of, like, make it up as you go along. Um, there's this... When you're doing magic, they call it patter. It's like, 
your tricks are going to fail. How do you respond when the tricks fail? And so you just kind of have to make up a story as you're doing it. Uh, Mark talked about improv classes. I think trying to do magic tricks serves a similar purpose. <laughs> um, but there is no script for these. This is true. It's mostly just me asking questions. I'm going to hopefully start coming up with some sort of theme so there's no dead space or us just rambling. But the rambling's kind of fun. Um, but a lot of it is I took four years of theater in high school, then stared down the barrel of college, realized that theater was not a way to really have a living, unfortunately, and moved to computer science. Kids, follow your dreams. Follow your dreams to computers. Yeah, I mean, one of the things that I'm hoping we can do with Captain Quail and with a lot of the other things that we're doing is make it easier for people who want to do arts to not think that they have to give up arts in order to be successful. Um, we are huge fans of artists, especially digital artists of all types, but we have, you know, semi first hand experience from this and anecdotal experience from all the artists and friends that we know that it is excruciatingly difficult to make a living as any sort of artist without languishing in obscurity and poverty for a good number of years. Uh, we're hoping to find ways to change that formula. Um, and if, you, if any of the audience has any ideas, we're definitely open to them, but keep on the lookout for us trying to experiment with new things to help, especially digital creators, make a living. Uh, but I think that's probably going to do it for this episode of the Vlogcast. I am going to give everybody a second to sign off, starting with Mark. Fare thee well, gents. And ladies, lady gents. <laughs> Chris. Thanks, everyone. Allison. <laughs> Allison doing her American Woodcock impression, and I am Philip saying thank you and good night.